I'm going to take you back to a time when black people thought they might have a chance at real progress and how it was stolen from black people using pure brutality and savagery. This story is not just a history lesson. It's a way to understand many of the things that we see today. So please, I encourage you to watch this video to the end because this is black history that everyone should know. This story is about what happened to the black community in Greenwood, South Carolina on election day of 1898. Before I get into this story, I need to give you some history first. You will need this history to fully understand why this atrocity happened. After the Civil War, Reconstruction brought significant changes to South Carolina. Emancipation and new citizenship rights for African Americans led to a biracial government that included black citizens in local and state government roles throughout the state. In 1868, black delegates made up two-thirds of the participants at a state convention that rewrote the Constitution, expanding voting rights for all South Carolina males. This period saw reforms aimed at aiding the impoverished state, including public education and rebuilding infrastructure, and criminal justice reforms, and land commissions to help small farmers purchase land, including black people. But this progress was short-lived. By 1890, former Confederates regained control of Southern states. With legal and governmental machinery in their hands, they implemented Jim Crow laws. This was a regime of mandated white rule and black disenfranchisement. These laws enforced racial segregation and were upheld through legislation and through fraud and violence, affecting every aspect of legal and social life of black people from cradle to grave. The Supreme Court played a crucial role in solidifying Jim Crow rule over black people. Landmark cases like the 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson legitimized the doctrine of separate but equal, allowing states to maintain segregated facilities. And in 1898, in a case called Williams versus Mississippi, it upheld the discriminatory voting laws that disenfranchised black voters. These decisions helped bring about a rise of politicians that were determined to keep black people down. Benjamin Pitchfork Tillman was a prosperous landowner from Edgefield County in South Carolina. He emerged as a political force in the 1880s. Despite his wealth, Tillman portrayed himself as a champion of the poor white farmers, rallying against the political elites whom he accused of exploiting these farmers. Tillman's rhetoric was inflammatory and he attacked bankers and merchants and politicians whom he claimed were ruining the lives of good, hard-working white farmers. Tillman's rise to power was marked by his keen understanding of white people's fears and their frustrations. In 1890, he was like the governor of South Carolina, and his influence only grew from there. By 1895, he led a state constitutional convention with the explicit purpose of ensuring white rule. The new constitution introduced literacy tests and poll taxes and other mechanisms designed to disenfranchise black people. Central to Tillman's strategy was the implementation of the Mississippi Plan in South Carolina. Originated in Mississippi, the plan was designed to circumvent the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed black men the right to vote. It included measures such as literacy tests and poll taxes, which were administered in a discriminatory manner to ensure that black citizens were effectively barred from voting in the state. Tillman openly advocated for these measures, arguing that allowing black people to vote was an existential threat to white rule in South Carolina. By implementing the Mississippi Plan, Tillman sought to create a political system where white rule could be maintained without the threat of black influence. And the Supreme Court rulings that I mentioned earlier, they provided legal cover for this disenfranchisement. Tactics such as literacy tests and poll taxes and the grandfather clause appeared to be race neutral, but were really designed to disenfranchise black people. These measures were upheld by the Supreme Court, effectively nullifying the protections of the 15th Amendment. Tillman's advocacy for white rule was not limited to legislative efforts either. He openly encouraged the use of violence to maintain social order. He supported lynchings and the actions of the red shirt militias. These were paramilitary groups that used terror and intimidation to suppress black political activity. The violence on election day in 1898 in Greenwood County is a direct example of how Tillman's policies and rhetoric translated into brutal action. The conflict began when angry white men attacked a prominent white Republican named Thomas P. Tolbert, who was collecting affidavits from black voters who were denied the right to vote that day. The Tolberts were a prominent Republican family led by patriarch John R. Tolbert, a Confederate veteran who had turned his allegiance to the Republican Party. John and his sons were committed to helping black people move into full citizenship. The Tolberts were a wealthy family and owned a lot of land. They would rent their farmland to black people and encourage black voters to stand up against the oppressive democratic regime that was trying to keep black people disenfranchised. The Tolbert's land in Phoenix had become a sanctuary and a safe haven for black farmers, and this angered a lot of people in Greenwood County. And this brings us to what happened on election day in 1898. On November 8, 1898, people gathered at Watson and Lake's general store in Phoenix, Greenwood County. Polling boxes were set up in the store. These farmers, some of whom were Klan members, watched closer to see how their neighbors voted and who they voted for. Outside of the store, a group of black farmers gathered. Tom Talbert had set up a wooden box to collect affidavits from black people who had been denied the right to vote under the state's new restrictive laws. These affidavits stated that the signer had attempted to vote and had been denied. That day, 20 black men had been turned down from voting. After being denied, the black men would then come outside, 
get the affidavit and sign it and put it in the box. A white man named J.I. Etheridge saw this and approached Tolbert. Etheridge accused Tolbert of deceiving black voters into thinking that they can vote when they could not. He kicked the box over and ordered Tolbert to leave. When Tolbert refused, Etheridge and another white man named Robert Cheatham began beating Tolbert. A black man named Joe Circus saw this and came to Tolbert's aid. An all-out brawl ensued and the four men crashed through the store's porch railing. It's unclear exactly what happened next, but a lot of people, including Joe Circuit and Cheatham, pulled weapons and started firing. Etheridge was struck in the middle of his forehead and died instantly. The local newspaper blamed Joe Circuit for what happened the day at the store. This violent encounter was just the beginning of this violence. News of what happened spread quickly. The next morning, hundreds of white men, many of them members of the Klan, headed to Rehoboth Church, where black people were gathered and discussing what had happened the day before at the store. Late in the afternoon, 300 white men held eight black people against their will with weapons drawn on them at the church. The black people tried to remain calm, but when someone began talking loudly and yelling and using profanity, a black man was yanked from his seat. And then the mob fired over 100 rounds into his body. When four black people tried to run to safety into the swamp, the white mob grew angry and then turned on the three black men who did not run, and they fired over 200 rounds into their bodies before they could even move from their seats. The mob ended up catching the four black men who ran. They tied them up and then they brutally executed them right there in the churchyard. They fired volley after volley of rounds into their lifeless bodies. They did this to warn the other black people about the consequences of voting. The black men's names were Wade Hampton McKinney and Jesse Williams, Columbus Jackson, and Drayton Watts. The massacre at the church did not end there. The mob was thirsty for more brutality. Mobs of white men roamed the countryside, capturing and executing black people. They would then leave their bodies displayed for everyone to see as a warning. They also wanted to take out the Tober family for helping the black people. The Tobers were forced to flee Greenwood and went into hiding. Some of the Tobers made their way to Washington, D.C., where they met with President William McKinley and begged him to intervene and to protect the election and black voters in Greenwood. President McKinley did nothing. Thousands of acres of the Tobers' land were seized, all because they dared to help black people. What happened at Phoenix left a deep scar on the black community there. This act of racial terror caused many to leave Greenwood County in large numbers. Benjamin E. Mays, the future leader of Morehouse College and civil rights leader, was a young child in Greenwood at the time. He remembered the mobs and the fear in black people. Mays said that he witnessed the terror firsthand. He saw his father humiliated by the armed white man. He said that this incident shaped his understanding of the world for black people and helped to fuel his lifelong commitment to fighting for civil rights. The Phoenix riot was not just about voting. It was about black people being seen as a threat to the white power structure and white rule. This story should serve as a reminder of the importance of voting. Entire black communities lost their lives for the right to vote. And as bad as this story was, it was actually used as a justification for another atrocity just two days later. The events in Greenwood County were not isolated. They were part of a larger pattern of violence and oppression. In our next video, we'll delve into another massacre that happened just two days after the Phoenix Massacre and is one of the most devastating acts of racial violence in American history. But for now, I want to know your thoughts about this video. Had you ever heard of what happened in Phoenix in 1898? And how did it make you feel learning what happened to this black community? Drop me a comment down below and let me know what you think.